I would say as the business progressed and, and Jerry and I matured and, you know, our, our responsibilities at Hilltop, they really just kind of evolved because we would take on a little more and Roy would, he liked to get away in the winter and go down to California for, you know, a month or two. So that really helped too, because then we fully had the reins while he was gone. He didn't have any control. So we got to do kind of what we wanted. But anyway, it, uh, so we just kept learning a little more. Uh, he'd, re you know, let go a little more. He, it's, he was an entrepreneur. They have a hard time letting go. He always wanted to, but not to the point of a nuisance for sure for either one of us, but it, you know, it took a while. And so we gradually learned it, which is a good thing because as we matured, then we got learning a little more and mm -hmm. picked up a few more responsibilities along the way just because he was gone for a little bit. Don't you say it? Yeah. And I yeah. think, you know, he and our mother would work shows, have us down working shows mm -hmm. and just leave us there. And it was really great because you'd just get to talk to customers and try to sell things. And I'll never forget the first time he wasn't there and I sold something and I said, I can't believe, it. I sold this couple from North Dakota. They got eight kids, this Yellowstone trailer. And he let me write out the check and I wrote out the check. It was a $4,000 sale. And I wrote the check for 40,000 and the guy just laughed at me. He says, I'm so sorry, I wrote this check wrong, sir. <laughs> it was the last check he had, but we had a good time. And uh, you know, he would give us the, the leeway to do that type of thing. So always uh, teachable moments, I guess. I would say, you know, Jerry and I were probably a perfect fit. You know, there's seven kids in the family. Only two of us decided to go into business. And you know, if you could have picked Two, looking back, I don't think you could have done any better because Jer was always focused more on the sales end of the business, and I was more focused on the service, the parts, and you know the mechanical side of it. So it fit. We could each take care of our own area, and but we worked very closely together because it all has to work together. So I, I think that looking back and and it all and it worked well for us uh, for, for all those years because we you know we were in business together for I don't know, 40 50 years you know and every day went to lunch together and, you know <laughs> we did everything together you know and we we did all our outside activities and, and not all but a lot of our acts outside activities and interests we do together so it uh, but I think we complemented each other very well I, I think when you say how could two of you work together, well, we found out early on, we went to a conference in South Dakota where it was just RV dealers from around the country, non-competing dealers. And the first thing they did was give Dick and I a personality test. And we thought, geez, what is, why are they doing this? And we get to the end of the day and they said, you know, Dick and Jerry, you two guys are perfect for each other. You come up on our scale of things as one being this and one being that, and you couldn't have a better relationship for a business than that. So we really think that you are headed for some success just because of your DNA together. We think that you're going to make, you know, you'll do just fine. So that was kind of interesting to us. I think the transition from mobile homes to RVs really happened in, in, I would say, the very early 70s. The reality of it was the mobile homes on our size of property there uh, in Hilltop, we didn't have enough room to be selling as mobile homes. They were getting too big. And there were the mobile home parks were not being built in the cities anymore because all the cities really wanted them out. So they were out in the country and we were in the middle of the city. So it really didn't make sense to remain in the mobile homes and the RVs were selling very well at the time. So it was kind of a, you know, I'd say an easy decision at that time for us. Yes, I, I think so too. I, I think the transition happened when mobile homes really were eight feet wide. When they went to 10 feet wide in the 60s and then 12 feet wide in the 70s, that took more space on our limited lot size anyway. So we could put a lot more RVs in place of a 12 by 60 or 12 by 70 mobile home. During our tenure, you might say, you know, of course, Roy faced his challenges and uh, we faced some challenges that during our time, the oil embargo of the 70s, of course, was huge because 
there was no gas. So, you know, people, we thought, who are gonna buy these things? It worked out all right, because a lot of people, there wasn't a lot of gas, but people still have to go out and have a vacation and be with their families. So instead of traveling with these, they'd, they'd park their travel trailer somewhere and then just take a smaller car or whatever it took to go out and use it. So it, it did help us get through that. And then, of course, it wasn't too many years later in 82, we had uh, the recession in 82. Mm -hmm. When we did that's when we expanded the business again <laughs> right <laughs> so not a smart thing but we did it <laughs> and the interest rates yeah. were very high during some of those periods so we not only dealt with a couple of oil embargoes manufacturers scrambled to find answers as well trying to make lighter weight products that really didn't come about or happen easily either because in trying to develop lighter weight products, they didn't have the know-how to do it. So we had issues with that too. We, we went through, I'd say a lot of back and forth with the consumer in the 70s and 80s with different challenges to our business. But basically I think interest rates and the economy uh, and fuel were the three things that stood in our way. Our father, he was, like I was saying earlier, he's an entrepreneur type and he had trouble letting go. And we could see, I think Jerry and I could see it was it was a good and a bad thing. Uh, you know, the bad thing is he didn't let people, he tried to do it all. And it was, it's too hard. And as a business guru, we could see that we can't do it all. And we, we need the people working with us have to be able to make decisions. And so we always said to everybody, we said, you know, you, you're in the front lines, you're working with that customer. If you think something needs to be done, do it. Take care, make sure the customer's happy. If we think that maybe we could have done it a different way, we'll talk about it afterwards, but we're, you know, we're never gonna get excited or worry about it. And so, you know, I, th I think that helped us to, you know, when the business was of a certain size, Roy could do that just fine. But as we started to grow the business, we, we knew we had to make changes in that department and, and it was a good thing because we saw how it worked before and what we needed to do to go forward I, you know yeah I, I think it was never a bad thing to delegate your philosophy to your employees because they understood what you wanted at the end of the day and they'd go along with it knowing that if that was a successful formula they could come up with that success as well so it was nice to get them on board and have them thinking like owners, we'd tell them a lot of time, even to salespeople. We want you to think like an owner. You want to treat these people right. We need to make a fair profit, but we need our customer coming back, uh, buying again, or sending you business. So I think some of the successes that Hilltop had played into fuel prices being high, interest rates high. We started selling tent trailers and tents were a lot lighter, easier to tow, smaller cars could tow them. But after a while, and it just kind of played into Jayco, the main brand that we carried, had a parent company in Australia, and they had a floor plan that was just out of this world. And they unveiled that one year, and we no sooner got it in, and we started selling it like hotcakes. So we ordered so many of that model that we tied up their production in almost just making that model. And that turned out to be, I think, after a couple of years, we were their largest tent trailer dealer. We sold over 400 in a year. But the tents came on really strong, I would say. Once we started selling the tents, we ended up, other manufacturers wanted us to handle them as well. So. And we, yeah, we took on the Coleman line and that became, we came, very successful with that and uh, and then the RV sales you know of the travel tours and that of course they blossomed with it because we got that beginning customer in the door that was just starting out and then they moved to the next level so it was it was a very nice fit and uh, probably one of our one of our successes I guess I think we we're probably most proud of is we also had a CSI award with Jayco which means customer satisfaction index and we were up mm -hmm. in the high 90s and there was nobody even close to us and so we were pretty proud of that that we could put all this product out the door out of that 
postage stamp lot we were in <laughs> and to keep people happy. So, I mean, it was, <laughs> we were pretty proud of that fact. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. We looked at this location here in university and uh, it was owned by a local car dealership here in town and the owner uh, owned numerous dealerships and real hard person to get an appointment with or anything. So we were working with his uh, real estate people and they said, well, the properties, we're pretty sure it's sold. And we thought, we knew the person that owned these car dealerships, he grew up in our same neighborhood. So we kind of had a little bit of a connection. So we really wanted to get a meeting with them and find out for sure if we were out of luck here or not. And so we set up a meeting. Well, we we really didn't set it. They set up a meeting. We're down in the Minneapolis Convention Center setting up for a show and we get a call. Jim will meet with you in 15 minutes. So God, we run over to his office and we get in there. What, 15 oh. people sitting around the table. So, so we go to the conference room in Golden Valley and there's 15 people around this table. Dick and I are in our work clothes. And pretty soon Jim walked in. He sat down and he asked us a little bit about ourselves. We weren't prepared for that. We were prepared to talk about this property. So he asked, first thing out of his mouth, where'd you guys grow up? We grew up in Northeast Minneapolis. Where'd you go to school? We went to school here. What do you like to do? And we said, well, we both like old cars. And we started talking and he gets up and he says, come on with me. So he took Dick and I, left everybody sitting in this room. We walked down in this building to a garage and he started showing us old cars he had. We're gone for maybe a half hour. Yeah, I'd say 45 it's a minutes, half hour. <laughs> looking yeah. at cars with yeah. Jim talking to, about cars. And then we go back to the room. Yeah. And it was, it was done. He just said, what, what do we have for a, a deal on that? Well, the post office has a uh, letter of intent. Sell it to these guys. They're good. They're good guys. <laughs> and that was the end of it. We ended up buying the property that day or making an intent to, to buy it that day. Yeah. He said, first time we went down to the post office and they saw our name. They says, well, you guys are on our property. <laughs> so, it's kind of funny. <laughs>